opportunity to express my gratitude to all of you who, for over all these many years, 53 years, that's how old Star Trek is, believe it or not. And we've lasted this long, not because of Gene Roddenberry, he created the show, but it's the support and the devotion of the fans that's given us this longevity. And looking over, I can see people I can identify as the original fans. <laughs> there you are. I can tell, and thank you original fans, you've changed quite a bit in 53 years. And that's good because we've all changed over the years, haven't we? But the amazing thing about the original fans is they have the ability to replicate themselves, procreate like triples, and there you all are, the next generation and the generation after that, and now little infants are coming, and they know how to go like this, on cue. Genetic change is happening over the generations. Well, it's this kind of devotion that's uh, given us the gift You've given us the gift of amplifying our voices. And I feel that like I have a responsibility to use that gift as responsibly as I can. And so I try to use it for uh, a positive purposes. And so thank you very much for this wonderful gift. And I appreciate it and I will use it. You're all lining up, so let's dive right into it. You've got the floor. I'm Uncle George. My daughter I'm Uncle George because she grew up with you. I have a lot of nieces and nephews and grand nieces and grand nephews. And I think you're awesome too. I love you all. Just came out last week 
with the uh, uh, purpose of informing all of us that we have a fragile democracy. We have to be actively involved and engaged in our democracy. It's a participatory democracy. And thank you to all for all your involvement to prevent this sort of thing from happening ever again. My book is a book of hope for a better America, built by better Americans, well informed. So thank you very much. Well, George, I think what I just want to say is it's an to meet you since um, this December is going to be the 40th anniversary of Star Trek and Motion Picture. Could you take us back and give us a, a memory of that production? Well, Yes, it's the 40th anniversary, isn't it? Star Trek is 53 years old, but for Star Trek the motion picture is 40 years old. And that too is another gift that the fans gave us. Because, you know, we were kept, at the beginning of each episode of our television series, we suggested that we were on a five-year mission, boldly going where no one had gone before. Five-year mission. But it seems even more destructive than the Klingons, where the NBC programming executives. <laughs> <laughs> Only three years, and our five year mission was aborted. And we thought, all right, it's over. We're proud of what we've done. We did good work. But that's showbiz, as they say. But when we went into syndication, they put us on every night, the whole week, Monday through Friday. And that's when we found all of you, the audience, and the story in the box office, I mean, the, the ratings. And it became so popular that Paramount decided, rather than reviving us as a TV series, we're going to revive us as a feature motion picture. We were just blown away by that idea. And then they hired Robert Wise, a legendary Hollywood director. And we thought, this is going to be something fantastic. And they gave us the kind of budget that allowed for all sorts of special effects. And so we were very excited about the, the, the uh, movie. And when we started, we started with all of the high expectations. And we had uh, a, a special effects guy uh, named Robert Abel, A-B-L-E. And we thought he was very able. But we started having problems. We, uh, the uh, special effects got slowed down. And we, uh, we were going over schedule which meant that we were going over budget as well. And the uh, tense executives started coming onto the set. Black suits with sober experiences, I mean, the expressions on their faces. And we knew we were in trouble. And the, the uh, schedule went over, over, and over schedule. And uh, they decided they're going to change the special effects guy. And uh, because it was getting too expensive and too uh, uh, overscheduled, they got rid of it and they brought on another guy. And then it speeded up again. But we went very over the uh, budget and schedule. And so when the film came out, the uh, studio had very uh, low expectations about uh, the box office. But again, all of you stepped in. The fans saved Star Trek, the motion picture. You went and saw it, and you saw it again, and again, and again. It's the same movie. <laughs> but you came to see it over and over again, and it exploded in the box office. And that's what made it a box office success. Your devotion and your absolute refusal to stop seeing it. 
Thank you very much, and that's it's because of that that we became a series of feature motion pictures. And that's why we're here 53 years old after Star Trek began and 40 years after Star Trek the motion picture was done. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Zach, and uh, my, me and my dad have been fans for, of you and the show for years on end, ever since I was young. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it today. So uh, I had him send me a question, and his question was, uh, what was the most challenging Star Trek episode to film, and why? Well, Zach, you are the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> and thank your dad for uh, having you. <laughs> I know you're very cool. <laughs> uh, the, uh, what was the question? <laughs> what was the most challenging Star Trek episode to come and why? Uh, the TV series or the feature film? TV series. TV series. The most challenging. Uh, we had some nip and tuck uh, scheduling problems. You know, we, we only had six days in which to film a whole episode. Uh, so it was usually one uh, week and another day of another week. And uh, some episodes uh, were, were, went into the wee hours of overtime. And I remember one uh, director, and I can't remember the, the episode, but we were shooting at like oh, past midnight, and uh, he was a very nervous director. I can't remember his name now. Uh, he was very anxiety, and uh, uh, during uh, uh, one of the shots, uh, when they were setting it up, I uh, left the sound stage to go to the trailer, and I saw him outside the sound stage. Uh, peeing in between the, uh, the uh, trailers. I mean, he, I, he, didn't, he was so nervous that he held it, and apparently he couldn't make it to the minister. <laughs> so he was peeing between. And I can't tell you what episode that was or who that director was. <laughs> but it was a horrible, <laughs> excruciating uh, episode to work on. <laughs> Long gone. before I finally, finally got my captain's seat. Now I have a question for George. Yes. You, uh, a lot of sci-fi actors have been typecast in the roles over the years. How did you break out of that to become making guest appearances on so many shows and things as George Takei and not Mr. Sulu? Well, it takes a long time. And yes, you know, uh, it was difficult going out for uh, auditions after Star Trek was, uh, was canceled. Uh, and people do, uh, producers do want different faces. We were so identified with the characters that we did uh, on, on the, the TV series that uh, they were reluctant to cast us. Uh, but I don't believe in complaining about it you know, after the fact. Uh, so what I decided to do after that was, uh, all right, I am uh, going to accept other invitations to uh, use my time. I, as you know, uh, am a political activist and I was involved in uh, the campaign to get our uh, city councilman in Los Angeles, elected mayor of Los Angeles. He was uh, an African-American city councilman a very decent guy and a very good problem solver. And uh, I, uh, he asked me to serve as uh, the chair of this Asian American committee, and I accepted that. And we worked hard, and he got elected the mayor of Los Angeles, the first African American. <laughs> and he 
turned out to be the best mayor that we've ever had. He was re-elected four times, served five terms, 20 years straight on as the mayor of Los Angeles, and became the most popular and longest serving mayor. And he asked me to serve on the uh, board of directors of the Southern California Rapid Transit District, which was a, a time engaging uh, appointment. And I decided, well, all right, I'm going to use my time to improve the uh, public tra transportation situation in Los Angeles. His mandate to us was to get started on building the first subway in Los Angeles. Los Angeles was known, and I think still is known, as a automobile dependent city. And I think Romney too is getting near that point. I know the traffic coming here to the convention center was very familiar to us. <laughs> it's a rare weekend though, it usually is not this bad. It's, not, it's only when we have these conventions. Correct. Yes, well that's good, that's good. We have that in Los Angeles all the time. They call it the freeway, but you, and you get on it for free. So, but then you park. We call it a parking freeway, and every three minutes you move about three feet. I bet you've been there. You know. So. Uh, uh, Mayor Bradley's idea was to have the first subway in Los Angeles go. And it was an exciting thing. We got a half cent sales tax pass for the local match. We went to Washington for the Washington, the federal match, to Sacramento for the state match. And uh, once we got the funds uh, together, we had to uh, hold uh, public hearings for route alignment, station locations, and they, they became very controversial, but we got that done. But once we started construction, I thought it would be prudent for me not to be involved because we were putting up detour signs, deflecting, uh, and I didn't want to have people demonstrating in front of my home saying, you know, I'm uh, ruining somebody's business. So after 11 years, I went to uh, Mayor Bradley and I said, uh, I've done my job. I think I'll go back to my career. And he understood. And uh, just then, 10 years after we were canceled, we came back as a feature motion picture. And I got my career back. So I took a little uh, uh, leave of absence from uh, acting. And that's how you survive that label of being a sci fi actor. I don't know what a sci-fi actor looks like. <laughs> it says looks like us. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, um, Allegiance. Any chance that would be made into a feature motion picture? And if so, would you be in it? Well, thank you for asking. Allegiance, for your information, is a musical that we developed about the internment of Japanese Americans. Uh, I've written an autobiography, and the first third is about our internment. But it's still letters on a page of, uh, of a, a book. And we wanted to humanize that story. And not only humanize it, but dig deep into the human heart. And nothing is more powerful at expressing emotion than a song and therefore a musical. And we developed this musical, Allegiance, which uh, deals with one of the most divisive, most destructive things that happened in the middle of uh, our imprisonment. A year into imprisonment, they uh, decided to come down